This presentation is designed to help you make better decisions about how to design effective instructional projected message presentations. The other day I was walking down the hall at work and I passed by a classroom where a social studies education student was making a presentation to the class about the Roman Empire. I stopped and watched for a moment through the window. A PowerPoint slide very similar to this one was displayed and the student was reading the text on the slide to the class. I didn't stay long enough to determine if the image of the Roman coin was specifically referenced in the presentation, though I suspect it was mostly included as a decoration. How many times have you experienced a classroom presentation that included this type of slide? Or how about a slide where a bulleted outline is used to organize the lecture content that will be presented for the next hour? So why did the developers of these PowerPoints decide to develop them in this way? Was their design based on all the modeling they received in their own education? Were they hoping to project information that would cue them to remember all the things they wanted to say to the students? Or did they just think that what they were doing was intuitively effective? Or maybe such design decisions are influenced by the default features provided in PowerPoint. When you create a new file in PowerPoint, the typical template pages do present a text field for a slide title and bulleted body text areas. Since its introduction in 1987, PowerPoint and newer but very similar multimedia presentation software tools have been used to present information to groups of people. Millions of presentations are given every year using these tools. And maybe the reason why so many people use bulleted outlines for their presentations is because it is a default template in PowerPoint. This conventional approach to presenting is appealing and intuitive, but this is more likely what people really see when they view such a slide. Or this. But these types of designs are not in line with how people really learn. So how should we design instructional messages according to how people learn? To help you understand what we know about how people learn best, scientific models associated with three assumptions about the brain will now be presented. These assumptions include dual channel. Humans possess separate information processing channels for verbal and visual material. Limited capacity. There is only a limited amount of processing capacity available in the verbal and visual channels. And active processing. Learning requires substantial cognitive processing in the verbal and visual channels. These assumptions about how the mind works can be directly applied to the phenomena of trying to learn from a multimedia presentation. This somewhat complicated diagram represents the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. So I know it looks complicated, but let's break it down into its individual components for just a moment because we're gonna use this model to help understand some of those limitations about the brain that were talked about or discussed earlier. So typical multimedia presentations include both words and pictures. Words are usually narrated either by the presenter or by the, the student or the, the viewer reading the words to themselves that are presented on a slide or the screen. This information enters the ear and is processed in the auditory mode. However, the words on the screen are also viewed with eyes along with any images. This information is processed in the separate visual mode. Learners must select which Im images and sounds or words they will pay attention to. The words and images that the learner chooses to pay attention to enters working memory where they are organized. This information remains separate with auditory words represented in the learner's mind, their deep working memory in the verbal mode and visual images represented in the mind in the pictorial mode. The sketch pad and pencil image reflects the learner's process of recording their representation of the images within their minds. 
Likewise, the iPhone voice memo app reflects the learners re recording their representation of the auditory information in their own minds. Finally, the learners' representations of words and images can be integrated into the existing body of information stored in long-term memory, represented by the hard drive. Now, in this model, it is important to understand the capacity of various parts of the system. Obviously, the capacity to communicate multimedia information is unlimited. Similarly, our brain's capacity to store information in long-term memory is also unlimited as far as we know. That's an interesting thing to consider, that we, we, we don't have a limit to the amount of information that can be stored meaningfully within the structures of our brain. Part of that is because the brain can just generate new, very microscopic structures to accommodate new types of information. But our capacity to select auditory words and visual images and organize them in our working memory is very, very limited. Here's a very simple example of how limited our selection and working memory organization capacity really is. So the following slides are going to present a number of dots. In, in the time allotted, view the dots and record the number of dots that you see. So you can number a piece of paper from one to five. If you don't want to do that, you can just try to remember them if you don't want to write them down. Are you ready? Here goes. Okay, it's time to grade. It's very likely that you easily identified the number of balls presented in the first three slides, but you probably did not have enough time to count all the balls in the last two slides. But your brain didn't really count the balls in the first few slides. It just knew the amount by taking in the picture as a whole because your working memory has the capacity to process and analyze and understand up to seven individual visual items at one time without being overloaded. But the other pictures, the pictures with more than, than five, six, or seven balls, you, you can't just look at those and your brain doesn't just know that that's what the amount is. It has to, it has to do some extra level of processing because it can't, it can't manage that many of discrete items at one instantaneous time and keep it, keep it that way in working memory. So that's kind of an easy way to understand the limited capacity of working memory. But there's another way that's, that's, um, that's very common and even easier to understand. So you're, you're probably made aware of these limitations whenever you have needed to remember a phone number. If you try to remember all seven digits of my office phone number here, you can do it most likely by rehearsing the number in your working memory over and over until you need to press the numbers on your phone. Now, you can keep rehearsing that for maybe up to a minute, probably more if you really concentrated, um, but you still might not be memorizing it into long-term memory. You might just be rehearsing it and keeping it in, in your short-term memory. But, but the point is you can keep it in short-term memory. It's seven digits, which is roughly the, the limit of discrete types of information, unless you did something to this number to make it less than seven distinct um, limits. For example, if you know that all the phone numbers on Radford University's campus begin with 831, you could just look at that as one thing and say, well, I already know that and I only have to focus on the 6859. But if you needed to remember a credit card this way, it would be much more difficult. This is 16 numbers of a, of a typical credit card. And you could look at all these numbers and you could try to, you, you could try to keep them in, in your working memory. You could try hard. You could read them all to yourself and try to keep reading. But the fact is, it's too many discrete pieces of information for you to actually keep in working memory without doing something to help you um, chunk some of that information into, into, into units because you, your working memory cannot 
cannot handle 16 discrete pieces of information, no matter how hard you tried to keep re rehearsing this. So th that's just a really simple way to illustrate and demonstrate how limited our working memory really is. So probably the reason why our cognitive processing is limited is because it requires active mental work on behalf of the learners. Learners must actively select the words and pictures that they um, need to pay attention to or that they want to pay attention to. They have to select that. They have to organize the sounds and images and, and convert them or translate them into the verbal mode and, and pictorial mode. They have to actively do that. And finally, they have to actively try to integrate the information or the or the stimuli that they've converted into verbal and pictorial modes in working memory, they have to actively integrate that into their long-term memory. It, and those are those are their own representations that they that they that they just got done um, um, sort of creating or developing. They have to then then, you, then they have to integrate that into their long-term memories. That's a lot of work. So what can teachers do to help learners best perform the work needed to process information needed for learning? What can they do? Most presentations involve some combination of images, text, and narration. The question is, what is the optimal combination of these elements and what's the best way to present them? Let's go back to our cognitive model of information processing to help answer that question, okay? One thing that a good presentation slide can do is to help the learners select the words and images on display that should be attended to. So one easy way to do this is to use words very sparingly and ensure that they are presented near the part of an image that is being addressed. This is called spatial contiguity. In this particular example, a slide presents a visual representation of photosynthesis along with a verbal description of photosynthesis. And in that verbal description, there are some important um, concepts and, um, and sort of elements of the image that are referenced, um, but they're, they're referenced in, in the text itself. So by employing the principle of spatial contiguity, the basic terms are presented near where they correspond to the visual representation. And the descriptive words are removed from the slide and they're left to the narrator to communicate. So again, this is a good way to help learners attend to the terminology that would be important for them to learn. And that terminology along with the images would in turn help reinforce the information that is presented um, in the auditory channel by the oral presentation. Signaling is another important means of directing attention to the important words on a slide that should be attended to. You can use highlighting like this or arrows to help direct attention. The animation of such features also help direct attention. So not just showing the arrow, but also animating it helps direct attention to specific things on the slide that you might want the learners to attend to. Now, even though words should be minimized on a slide, they often do help people learn from presentations. Pictures, however, should be included as an important informational element in most slides if possible. Let's look at why. Of course, it's much easier to develop a presentation that is just narration. In this way, words that define important concepts and ideas are presented orally without any present visual presentation support. This activates the auditory processing mode. However, you've wasted a, a, a channel of information that again is processed separately. So in the case of kind of storytelling, such as a lecture, or if you're at church and you're listening to a sermon, the learners have an excess cognitive capacity left over because their visual processing mode is not activated. So it's, it's generally more effective to present pictures and corresponding words. However, you need to avoid interference and overload.
Engaging both auditory and visual processing modes can be very effective, but it's very important to avoid overloading working memory's processing ability or creating interference with competing messages in the same mode. Let's see what I'm talking about here. So the conventional wisdom is that the visual support for the information will make the overall presentation more effective. And it's true that written text is first processed visually. However, as the, auditor, as the audience reads the on-screen text to themselves, they're using their auditory processing capacity to search for keywords to store on their voice memo app. This results in, in interference. The learners are hearing two voices in their head, their voice and the voice of the narrator. And that kind of interference could make it more difficult for them to actually um, attend to and consequently process the text information. Always be aware that anytime you place text on the screen, the audience will devote cognitive capacity to silently reading the text rather than focusing on the speaker's words. This suggests that the conventional presentation with narration and on-screen text is counterproductive because it requires extra auditory processing without adding meaning beyond what is being spoken aloud. Many presentations attempt to convey even more information to the audience using images and on-screen text along with narration. Of all the alternatives shown so far, this places the highest cognitive load on the audience. The visual processing centers are overloaded with images and text while the auditory centers are conflicted between reading text and listening to the speaker. The high cognitive load makes it very difficult for the audience to identify the few key pieces of data that deserve to be held in working memory while mental models are constructed. So what can you do about that? Well, to remedy it, it's best to present words as speech rather than on screen text for animations and complex Im images. So here I have this really great animated image of a chemical process, a modeling of a chemical process that goes on during photosynthesis. And as, as a science teacher, I could talk at length about what's actually happening um, within this process. Now, some of, some of what's happening is described in the text to the right, but having learners try to view the image and listen to a, a science teacher talk about it and read the slide, you're talking about interference going on in both the visual and auditory channels. A much better option is just to present the image on the presentation and let the, um, let the teacher describe what's going on auditorily. There's no reason to have any text on that slide other than the fact that the teacher might wanna use it to cue what they're supposed to say but the teacher should be prepared and know what to say when, the, when this image is presented. So finally, a good way to easily fix that very first slide, that social studies presentation slide that I, I noticed while I was wandering the halls of the education building, is simply to remove the text and include a graphic that can be used to help cue the learners to the important information that's being communicated. For example, maps can be very, very powerful and important images to support an oral presentation. Now, granted, they can be visually busy at times, but they can also be used to help situate important information and direct attention to important features of the oral presentation as well. This is much more effective and, use, and a useful visual than the Roman coin that was initially um, presented. And to be honest, one good thing that could be done even to this map would be to remove any of the labeling until such labels were used to help describe specific locations on the map during the oral presentation. So hopefully this brief video has helped you better understand the value of using cognitive learning theory to help you develop more effective projected messages like PowerPoint presentations in the future. So we addressed the fact that, the, that we process uh, verbal or auditory and visual um, information in separate channels. Those are separate. We have very limited capacity to um, 
to what happens, particularly in, in, in working memory. And part of the reason why our capacity is limited is because we have to actively process. We have to actively um, select, organize, and integrate the information. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, any of the information presented, a some of the information in this slideshow was initially um, developed by Kevin Gee in a presentation called The Science of Presentations, uh, which is a, an, an excellent um, summary and overview of a lot of the information presented and most of the science behind um, this presentation and behind the science of multimedia um, for learning can be found in the very, very seminal book, Multimedia Learning by Richard Mayer.